from presenting your research results to a policymaker or manager, um, to preparing for a media interview um, or a job interview even, right? Um, to outlining your presentation. I actually am working with a group of folks um, who uh, were at a workshop with us in January, and they're um, working on a collaboration for a science policy forum paper. They're using the message box to help themselves as a group get on the same page uh, with their message before starting to write their draft so that they're not getting hung up on citations and specific details or wordsmithing. They're trying to make sure that they're all on board with the same concept by using the message box before moving forward. Um, so there are really a lot of different ways to use the message box and the messages that come from it. Um, so just something to keep in mind as we walk through the mechanics of it a little bit. So we've talked a lot about your audience, about you as a communicator and your interactions, but we haven't talked about the important stuff, right? Your science. And so here's the big problem with talking about your science. You know too much, <laughs> right? You know more about your subject than almost anyone else. Um, and especially more than non-scientists, right? And your tendencies, we talked about with the fire hose effect, is to want to share it all. Um, and it can feel daunting, sometimes really impossible, to come up with a clear, self-contained message that anyone could understand from everything that you've got stored up in your brain, right? Um, I know there's a lot of information in there. It's probably a big jumble. It makes a lot of sense to you, but everybody's got a different organizing method, right? It's like looking at somebody's desk. Um, but you also have to remember that you didn't learn all of this overnight. You've been studying this for years. So it's not realistic to think that you could share more than a fraction of what you know with someone during a short conversation. And so if you're going to avoid um, fire hosing everyone, you really need to think about how you can distill your messages into something that's a little bit easier to swallow. That is not photoshopped, thank you. <laughs> so, say I were to put this tray of things in front of you for a moment. And then I take it away. Now, take a moment, get that pen back out, write down three things you remember from the tray. Oh, toast. Was cool. there toast? I don't know. I don't know. There could not. be. Could be. <laughs> I like that. Toast is a good thing. Necklace. Yeah, a piece of jewelry, I think. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many of you had all three of the same things? How many had two of the same things? Okay, a few people. How many had one same thing? But if I showed you a tray like this, everyone would be able to remember the same three items, right? And I know you've all heard this before, but this is why. Cognitive research tells us that our brains can only hold three to five pieces of information in our short-term memory at any one time. Sometimes I think it's like one, I struggle with two. But the point is, or zero in this case, um, the point is, is that you want to limit the number of ideas that you share, because if you want people to remember what you've said, you have the opportunity to pick those top three pieces of information and focus on those. Otherwise, they are going to remember what they want to. Again, we talked about this earlier, right? Word choice matters too. Jargon is a great way to turn people off. It can be a beautiful thing when you are with an audience of your peers. 
It lets you say exactly what you mean. But in reality, it's a specialized language and you spent years learning it. And it doesn't work at all for those outside of the circle. And in fact, it might mean something really different to a non-scientist. Sometimes terms that you think are really clear are not. And we call this sneaky jargon. For me, I always thought it was pretty easy to figure out what adaptive management was. Um, I mean, everyone knows the word management, right? And unless you're a toddler, you know what it means to be adaptive, right? So I was just like, those two words, simple, put them together. But in reality, it is a technical and nuanced term. And there are lots of different understandings of adaptive management, even within the scientific community. And using it publicly often leaves audiences feeling alienated and like you don't understand, they don't understand what you're talking about at all. So these are some really good examples of sneaky jargon. Um, positive feedback is one of my personal favorites because that one I think made my mind explode my first year in grad school. Um, can anyone think of good examples of sneaky jargon from their worlds? Um, in physical oceanography, they talk about anomalies, which is um, an app, like an average trend. And to other people not in the science world, it means something out of the ordinary. So that's one that I encounter a lot. In a recent uh, uh, news interview, I used recruitment, and I had some on there. On there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Any others? <laughs> Definitely. Or you try out there a theory is a huge one. Mm -hmm. And I just think any app, all the acronym stuff. Oh yeah. Well that's my next slide. <laughs> Steal my thunder, man. Um, any others? Yeah. I I written proxy in my little oh. statement. Uh-huh. Yep. All right. Well it's really fun to play um, we call it jargon bingo. Um, when we, we listen to people walk through their message boxes and pull out all the jargon. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, uh, acronyms, right? Just like jargon, you should avoid them. Uh, the acronym soup is super common, especially when working with government agencies. I mean, and even this group just itself is like huge acronym soup with all the institutions that are here. But just like jargon, chances are somebody in your audience, at least some of them, don't know what that acronym means, and it's a foreign language to them. Another thing that most audiences have in common is that they want to know the bottom line up front. As scientists, we spend so much of our time on background and supporting material and how it ties into the broader body of knowledge, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> But whether we're talking to journalists, policymakers, or members of the public, we need to flip how we communicate our science on its head. Most other people are less concerned with how we got our results than what those results are and how they affect them. We need to talk in clear, concise terms about what we know, why it matters, and then be ready to back it up. Of course, it is not just the language we use, but how we present this information that's really important too. And as scientists, we all learn to communicate like this. But to reach a broader audience, we need to structure things differently, right? And even though we publish papers in this format, we generally neither write them nor read them in that order. Enter the message box. So again, the intent of this tool is to help you sort through that mound of information you have in your head and to distill that complexity down to the essence of what it is that you want to convey to a specific audience. So I'm going to walk you through each of the different sections to give you a sense of how the tool works. Um, and just again, remember that this is a sorting tool to help you organize
organize all the information in your head and distill it down into uh, meaningful pieces uh, for your intended audience. So the first thing you want to do is identify your audience. That is the most important part of the message box. Um, and it's really important that you start with that because all of the other um, pieces of the message box are gonna flow from there. So after you define your audience, you can really um, do any of these sections in the order that feels most comfortable to you. Um, this is an iterative process as well, but I typically like to start with the issue, um, which is the overarching topic um, or big, at a big broad scale. Uh, kind of the 30,000 foot level of what it is that you are working on or trying to communicate about. And related to that is the problem, which is your slice of the issue. And this could be the results of your study or perhaps a research question. Um, and one way of distinguishing the problem from the issue is I often think of the issue as the search terms that you might use when researching this problem. You'll also want to think about the solutions. Um, you've identified the problem. What are you going to do to fix it? Um, what are we going to do? Maybe what can your audience do to make it better? Um, you'll need to articulate the benefits as well. Um, and this gets to how um, the solutions you've outlined here will benefit your audience. Um, why would this matter to the world? So I sometimes think of these as co-benefits. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this comic, it's everywhere. Um, but if we were doing a message box on, and the solution, excuse me, was to keep global temperatures from rising one and a half degrees Celsius, then these would be the benefits. So these are the outcomes of the solution that we aren't necessarily targeting, right? That's not the thing we're trying to do, but they're all gonna flow from the solutions and these are all gonna benefit our audience. And then finally, um, what we just finished discussing earlier was the so what, right? This is the really critical part. Um, why should your audience care about what you're saying? How does this matter to them? And again, this is the key part about knowing your audience. You have to know who your audience is and what they care about. And only then can you transfer your information in a way that they will understand. Okay, so that's the message box. Um, and now we're gonna walk through uh, uh, an example. Um, and uh, so this is a, some really successful message box work by Jenna Jambeck, who is an engineer out of uh, University of Georgia. Um, so she reached out to Compass a few years ago uh, to try to get some help preparing for a AAAS press briefing about some of her recent work. And when we first sat down with her, we asked her what the four key takeaways from her work were, was. And she said, in classic scientist fashion, it's all on the paper. And then dove into this. Global plastic resin production reached uh, 288 million metric tons in 2012, the 620% increase since 1975. Okay, takeaway number one. This is takeaway number two. In 1960, plastics made up less than 1% of municipal solid waste by mass in the U.S. By 2005, plastic made up at least 10% of solid waste by mass and 58%, 61 out of 105, of countries with available data. Okay. Um, we estimate that 2.5 billion metric tons of municipal solid waste was generated in 2010 by 6.4 billion people living in 129 coastal countries, 93% of the global population. Approximately 11%, 275 million metric tons of the waste was plastic. Okay, that was number three. This is number four. We estimate that 99.5 million metric tons of plastic waste was generated in coastal regions in 2010. Of this, 31.9 million metric tons were classified as mismanaged and, and an estimated 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons entered the ocean in 2010, equivalent to 1.7 to 4.6 of the total plastic waste generated in those countries. Okay, yes. So that's a lot of plastic. It's also a lot of information, right? 
So to try to get Jenna to really focus down and narrow in on one thing, the one point that a person, she might want a person to know, we asked her, how much plastic entered the ocean in 2010? And we just got the same answers from her. <laughs> she went right back to all the numbers and there are so many numbers. 26, 26 numbers and four takeaway points. There's no way anyone could retain any of that, not even a single piece. There's just too much information there. So we sat down with Jenna and worked through a message box. And this took a lot of work, um, and, but we honed in on this, right? The issue is plastic pollution of the ocean. Well, and first I should say that her audience was prestige media. This was a big paper. This was the first study of its kind and she knew that their findings were really significant as an important, not p-values, um, and she wanted to make a splash. Um, so the issue that she had identified was plastic pollution in the ocean. The problem that we don't currently know how much plastic is in the oceans or where it's coming from. Okay, that is kind of a big problem. Um, so what? Plastic pollution is ugly and unsafe. Larger pieces entangle, choke, and kill animals. They can eat small bite, small bits, and they have unknown, probably negative health effects. We may be poisoning our seafood supply. That's huge, right? That is definitely something that is a story, and that is definitely something that a national public <laughs> via media would be interested in hearing about. The solutions. Large scale cleanup is unfeasible. We have to stop the flow. And then again, why the study is significant. Um, it's the first ever to track annual inputs by country so that they can help design systems to prevent plastics from entering the ocean in the first place. That's awesome. And then what about the benefits? She brings it back to humans and economy. It's not just about the animals. It's about creating healthier living conditions for people by properly managing waste streams, right? And that plastic is a resource and it can be used as a revenue stream. So given her what she wanted to do with this work, we didn't end with just the message box, right? Because there's a difference between the message box and your messages, which we'll talk about in a minute. But we helped her then work through and translate these simple and powerful messages to sound bites and visual metaphors. We estimate that people added 8.8 .8 million metric tons of plastic to the oceans in 2010. It's a lot, right? She answered our question, fine. <laughs> that is five grocery bags of plastic going into the ocean along every foot of coastline in the world. Right? That's a great visual. Now you know how much plastic she's talking about. We are taking out tuna and putting in plastic. Another great visual of what the problem is, what is happening. So what happened? After the paper was released in the AAAS uh, panel, there was massive uptake in the media. Google returned more than 430 news items in a two-day period. The sound bites and uh, clips got picked up everywhere. Um, and by keeping her message simple, right, she wanted to add all the data and she wanted all the background, but she finally came around to really keeping her message simple. And by doing that, she was able to drive the press coverage message. You see the 8 million number over and over again. Um, right here at WAPO, 8 million metric tons. Um, the Times in, over in the UK, 8, mil 8 million tons. They don't need to say metric. Um, <laughs> uh, NPR, 8 million, 8 million tons. Um, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Business. I mean, this is another great one that they came up with. Plastics weighing as much as 191 Titanics clogs the ocean. Like, that's a, that's a ridiculous visual. 
So you can just see this really permeated the media um, at the time. It was huge. And this was exactly what Jenna was looking for. This is what she knew the study was worthy of. And then, um, just a clip from a story that Christopher Joyce did on this. Um, and just as you listen, kind of think about um, some of the things that Jenna is doing well, some of the references she, she might be making to herself and her life, um, and why she does what she does. Plastic transformed the world. It's light, durable, and lots of stuff can be made out of it. But it's also transforming the oceans, and not in a good way. A lot of plastic ends up there. As NPR's Christopher Joyce reports, scientists are just now getting a handle on how much plastic has gone to sea. Scientists have been trying to figure out how much plastic is in the ocean. The best they could do is make a rough estimate. After all, the oceans cover 70% of the planet. But another way to figure out what's out there is to measure what's coming off the land. That's what engineer Jenna Jambeck at the University of Georgia decided to do. She was a good fit for the job. My thing is really waste management. That's what I fell in love with. And love would not be an overstatement. I take photos of the way people manage waste all over the world, take pictures of garbage cans. Yeah, and I met my husband at the landfill. At least he understands me. Jambat undertook a unique project to study waste streams in 192 countries. She gathered data on how much waste each country generates and how it's managed. She calculated how much is plastic and how much exists within 30 miles of an ocean. Researchers inventoried what was on the beaches, and here's what she found. In 2010, there was 8 million metric tons of plastic entering the ocean globally. Plastic bottles, candy wrappers, laundry baskets, syringes. Jambet calculates that's like putting five bags of plastic trash on every foot of coastline in the world. Observations. I, I really like the, the personal element in there because one thing I was going to bring up before, one of the challenges with these is it's really effective to get a story like this and media love it, 8 million tons of plastic, but how do you get past the, like these sort of what I call risk living stories of like, it's terrible, we're screwed, it's terrible. Uh, how do we both have the personal connection and Where's the positive action piece on the other end? And how do we try to get that to be picked up by media? But I did really like the, you know, those, those, those personal elements. Because I think the audience side from some of these like 100% negative stories, you can just get real turn off to. Right. And I mean, how personable is she there, right? Like, you don't really think, I mean, scientists are a little quirky. Engineers are like, wait, quirky. Right? And like, <laughs> waste management. Like, what? <laughs> but she clearly has such a great personality. She clearly loves what she does, right? And she lets that shine through. Um, so you really get a sense of her as an individual and as a researcher. Yeah. Any other observations? Yeah, Kim. Um, I think what I really liked is um, in both of those examples is when they pull in, um, you can say 8 million. Tons. It's kind of hard to imagine that. So when you actually bring in something that's kind of easy to understand, like per, per foot or whatever, mm -hmm. it's super helpful. Like with, with Steve's speed talk earlier, he was talking about all these calories that the, the fish take in, and then he compared it to the same calories in a Twix um, yes. butter peanut butter <laughs> basically bar. Yeah. Um, or like the story with the, the 90s or so um, Titanics and whatnot. Yeah. It makes it that kind of just really sticks in your brain mm -hmm. and uh, makes it a lot easier to imagine um, the problem at, at hand because it's so it's such a large pro problem yeah visuals are great and we'll talk a little bit more about framing in a minute um, and the other thing too is that she came up with that right so you know if you don't give the journalist or your audience a metaphor a way to picture it they're gonna come up with